Well, good morning. So I'm not Pastor Phil, obviously. Um, Pastor Phil is on the road to recovery. He fell out of a tree last weekend, and um, we are in a new series called James, A Faith That Works. And Pastor Phil really, really wanted to preach this morning, but he had surgery on Friday, and his doctor said, you will be on pain medication, and you will not want to preach. So I told him, I said, I'll preach, I'll do it, I would love the opportunity. So if you don't know me, my name is Tucker Kelly, I'm one of the pastors here, and I oversee the student ministry. And as we're going through this series, James, it's a faith that works. And we understand in life, there are many difficulties. And I think James does a really good job in verse one, and he just explains, hey, I'm a servant of Christ. And then in verse two through 11, which we're gonna cover today, and we're gonna hit on verse 12, he talks about the difficulties of life. Now for me, I understand that buying a home is a blessing and a burden. Some of you have bought a home. Some of you have lived in many homes. And what I heard on my first home buying was, hey, isn't it a blessing, but it's also a burden? And they always say, home ownership, right? Because there's always something that seems to go wrong. At the end of 2016, me and my wife were able to buy a house. There was four in Wilmington. Um, that we could choose from because of our finances. Um, but we could afford a home. And my mom had told me earlier on, she said, Tucker, if you buy a home as soon as possible, you'll thank me later. I am thanking her right now to this day. And so we, you know, we had four homes to choose from within our price range that was really, really low. And the nicest one we found downtown is this sweet little bungalow home. I liked it a lot. It was my favorite. A lot of character. The house was built in 1920. Um, and it felt that way. It definitely did. There was a lot of work that needed to be done, but we could afford it, and we just so cherished it. For some reason, though, in 1920s, they decided to have five children in a tiny bathroom. I don't know why. This is a, like, you know, a Jack and Jill home, so there's a bedroom here, there's a bathroom, and then there's a bedroom, and then there was a side room. And it was really small, but it was perfect for my little family, just me and my wife and a dog. And my wife was very pregnant at the time, and you know, I was looking at the bathroom and I was like, that big belly is hard to get through the vanity and the tub just to get to the toilet. And so I wanna do something about it. So, you know, I didn't have the money to just add an addition and I didn't have the skill sets to move things around, nor did I have the money to do that. And so I looked at the vanity and for some reason they put the largest single sink vanity in the smallest bathroom known to man. So I looked at that and I was like, hmm, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna replace it. So I did what every wise DIYer would do. I looked on YouTube. I went to YouTube and I watched hours and hours and hours of YouTube videos until I felt confident enough to be able to go to my favorite hardware store, Lowe's. I love Lowe's. Some of you I've seen at Lowe's on the same day three times. Um, you know who you are. We've seen each other. That means we didn't do a very good job on the project maybe or we forgot things. But I felt pretty confident about it, so I went home and um, I had this vanity and HGTV taught me one thing. Demo day is awesome. So I got my glasses, I got my hammer, and I'm just taking out a vanity. Like, it's not that big of a deal. But you see, I was just so excited to get the project started that I forgot the most important thing that you need to know. When, you got it. I forgot to turn the main water line off. So I'm in there and I'm doing what I'm doing and my wife, very pregnant, comes in and she says, how long is this gonna take? Two hours, two hours max. Husbands, don't ever say that. Don't put a time on it. If you have to, double it, triple it, do whatever you can. It's gonna take all weekend. So she goes back in and I'm getting after it. I'm feeling pretty good about it. And I start cutting away some of the caulking and all these different things and I get the sewer pipe out and I think, I think I'm ready to do this. I think I'm ready to pull this thing out. And so I stand up and I give it a grunt and a, and a pull and, uh, and nothing happens. It doesn't budge. Like, okay, all right, let's try it again. YouTube says to do it harder. All right, let me do it harder. So I do it harder and then all of a sudden I feel something on my leg. It's water. And then it's like, you know, it's not that much at first, but then it's a lot. And I freak out and I try to turn the supply lines off as quickly as I can. That didn't help. And Miranda comes in. At this point, she's very pregnant and very annoyed. And I just wanted to smile at her and say, everything's going to be fine. But I, I couldn't. I said, go to your mom's for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to go to your mom's. And so this was an entire weekend project. Um, 
But things get worse, right? Like bad days, more bad things take place. So as she's packing her bags, I'm running outside to the main water line, and I take my little, you know, tool, and I try to turn it off. Well, it's rusted on, and I can't turn it off. So all the while, water is just bursting into my bathroom, and I'm thinking, oh, man, there's going to be so much cleanup. This is supposed to be an easy project. But for the Kelly boys, for the Kelly men, there's never an easy project. We can't do things the first time right. We have to trial after trial five times, and then we get it right. So I called Cape Fear Public Utility. They came out, praise God, and he was like struggling to turn it off, and then he fixed that issue. So that weekend, I spent most of the time cleaning everything up, and then I pulled um, the vanity out. There it is. Um, Chick-fil-A got me through, and the Clorox wipes wiped my tears. Um, <laughs> but you can see how tiny this bathroom was. Like, this was so small, and you can see how large the vanity was, and um, I just needed to take that out. But if you have breath in your lungs, you realize that there are difficulties in life. But those difficulties, they strengthen us, don't they? See, without difficulties, we would not grow. See, now that I've experienced something like that, I can do a vanity in 30 minutes. I did one at my newest house. It was great. It felt awesome. And nothing bad happened. In fact, I was also able to help a woman out in the community who needed help, and she needed to redo her bathroom. And I went in there, and I had a little bit of knowledge, and we were about to work. And I said, is the water line off, the main water line off? I know about the water line. I know about that. We need to make sure we turn it off. But it helps us grow through these things. And I was able to do it. And then the bathroom looked like this um, as we were selling our home. Um, that's so sweet. It's a cute little bathroom. It's still really, really tiny, but, you know, we made it through. Um, so we sold that home. We no longer live there. I've been in another home and another home since. We're just doing the home buying and moving up. Um, but I won't be doing that for a long, long time. Long time. I'm not moving again. So without difficulties, we know that we wouldn't be able to grow. I think difficulties test our faith greater than anything else, don't they? We start realizing as we go through these difficulties, our faith and our strength in the Lord grows stronger. And I think as we see these trials, our faith grows to be more genuine. And we see that it grows stability in our lives. And there's four areas of stability that these trials grow in our lives. And we'll cover two of them today. We'll see that faith that works produces stability during the trial. James gets right into the matter of it. He says, I'm a servant of Christ. Now let me tell you what's going on. Because these People in Jerusalem, the church of Jerusalem, they are dealing with difficulties, probably more than we have to deal with even today. But he says this in verse two, check this out. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Several things that James tells us about trials that we need to understand from these, this passage. And the first thing is that trials are inevitable. They're going to happen. We can't run away from them. The more we try to run away from our trials, the more we're actually running away from God. And we're actually running into temptation. Trials are inevitable for two reasons. Number one, because of the consequences of the sinful world the consequences of a sinful world. We see that it's not if you meet trials of various kinds, it's when you meet trials of various kinds. Why? Because of the consequences of a sinful world. We see Job's so-called friend Eliphaz says this in Job, for a man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. It's inevitable, it's going to happen. We see David say, be not far from me for the trouble is near. And then Jesus even says this. He says, in this world, you will have trouble. But I love the next part of that because he says, take heart for I have overcome the world. So we have someone to lean on in the trouble. And then Paul talks about affliction. He says this, afflicted in every way. Because of this sinful world, we have trouble. There is bad news. Why? Because of sin. Sin breeds death and shares bad news with all of us. And I think there's two professions in this world that always is constantly sharing bad news. The first one is a mechanic. You go in for a spark plug change, and then you leave with a brand new engine. You're like, what in the world? What happened? The mechanic calls you, and he's like, hey, that's gonna be $5,000. 
Well, I was, just thought I was getting my brakes replaced. What's going on? Well, your engine needed to be remade. So it's, we did that for you. We took care of it. Now you owe us 5000 And then the doctors, you know, the doctors always have bad news to share too. They never say anything good. They just let you know when they're calling, hey, I've got bad news for you. And there's a story of a doctor and he tells his patient, he's like, I got bad news and I've got worse news. The patient looks at him and he's like, okay, all right, sounds good. What's this bad news? Tell me the bad news first. And the doctor looks at him and he says, you have 24 hours to live. The patient looks at him wide-eyed, starts thinking, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna say? How am I gonna handle this? What do I do? Is my will and testament ready? Do I need to talk? Who do I need to talk to? And then finally he realizes he's got worse news than just that. And so he looks at the doctor and he said, what can be worse than that? (laughs) And the doctor says, well, the worst news is I forgot to tell you that yesterday. I mean, that's how life is, right? It just keeps getting worse and worse, and the effects of sin is just that. It's death, and it's awful. There's another reason why trials are inevitable. It's because of our connection with our Savior. And you go to think, you're like, wait a minute, didn't Jesus say in Matthew 11, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest? He did. But what do we need rest from? The trials, the persecution. We see that Jesus says this in John 15, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. We also see Paul remind Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, will be persecuted. In the 1900s in China, there was the Boxer Revolution. And this wasn't a time where they were revolting against underwear. This is actually a time when there was an uprising and they wanted to purify China's culture. Their goal was to get Christianity out. And in the northern part of China, there was this mission station house that housed students, maybe a hundred or so. And these people came in and they blocked all of the exits. And as they blocked the exits, they left one exit open. What they did was they put a little cross on the ground and they told everybody in the mission station house, If you trample on this cross, you can walk out in freedom. Well, the first person, they go, and they get up to the cross, and they trample on it, and then they walk into what they thought was freedom. Then the others go, and then we get to the eighth person. There's a little girl, young girl. She carefully walks up to the cross. She kneels before the cross, and she says, God, give me strength. Give me strength in this moment because she knew that what she was about to face. And so she needed prayer for, for, she needed to pray for that strength. And so as she was done praying, she gets up carefully and she avoids the cross, walking straight to the firing squad. This young girl, that is a genuine faith, ladies and gentlemen. That is a faith that is genuine. But what's beautiful about this story is that the other 92 followed in her faith footsteps. They did the same exact thing that young girl did. Not only did it help her stand against the firing squad, but it encouraged 92 other individuals to do the very same thing. And that day, they got to step into glory. Yes, they were shot and killed, but they got to be with the Father. And I do believe that those who persecuted for Christ will receive a great reward in heaven. But even if so, they got to see and be with their Savior in heaven for eternity. They really walked into freedom that day, didn't they? Is your faith that genuine? Is your faith genuine enough to be able to spur on 92 other people to the point of death? That got me thinking. So in this world, we will experience trials. They're inevitable. But trials are also innumerable. They come in all shapes and sizes. We see when you meet trials of various kinds. For some people... One trial may be very, very difficult. For another, it might just be a walk in the park. That's because we're wired differently. That's because we have different strengths. That's because we're able to go through different things. Some are just more spiritually mature. But here we see the word various is the word that means multicolored or many-sided. It's the same word that Jesus uses when he's telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. And when the man gets beat up, he's beat up on all, all surrounds. On all sides, he's taken out. And that's kind of how our trials are. They're waiting and lurking around to attack. They're unwelcome guests in our life. 
And like I said, the more we try to run from them, the more we're actually running from God. And sometimes God uses people in our life. Sometimes it's the annoying people at work. Sometimes it's the really talkative people that you're like, can you just not say any more words? Sometimes he uses our children, right? They're, they're great at sanctifying us. Sometimes he uses that school bully. There's children in the room, you know that bully just keeps getting at you and getting at you, but God is using them for a purpose. Sometimes God uses circumstances. Now understand that there are a lot of people in this church that are dealing with so many kinds of circumstances, specifically cancer. And I understand that cancer is taking people and they find these new, this news out and it's hard to hear and it's difficult to swallow. But I want you to know that you are at a church where your pastors, your deacons, they care for you. They want to pray for you. They want to know what's going on in your life. And I want to let you know that every Monday, the pastors get together and we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are hurting. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We spend a lot of time thinking about these things. And if we don't know, then we can't pray. So please let us know what you're going through. Don't walk through it alone. Our elders do the same thing. We meet twice a month, and we spend a lot of time praying for your needs. So please, don't go through these kinds of things alone. Know that you can rely on us, but even greater, you can lean on God in this trial. He also uses things. He uses people, circumstances, and sometimes he uses things like my bathroom. He sanctified me, and now I was able to help out a lady in the community. I think that's pretty cool. C.H. Spurgeon once wrote, God does not put, away or put heavy burdens on weak shoulders. God educates and tests our faith by trials that increase in proportion to our faith. God expects us to do the adult work and to endure adult afflictions only after we've reached a mature status in Christ Jesus. Therefore, beloved, expect your trials to multiply as you proceed toward heaven. We can't get away from them. They're going to happen. Why? Because trials are imperative. Trials are imperative. Testing of your faith produces steadfastness that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Trials help us with endurance. They produce endurance in our life, and that endurance means to bear up under. You see, a strong faith, it doesn't bail out, but it bears up under. No matter the circumstance, we can endure. You see, God is like the perfect trainer. He knows how to get our muscles working where they should be. He knows how to get our faith where it should be. He has the perfect diet. He has the perfect workout plan, the perfect kind of weights, the perfect kind of workouts, not to destroy us, but to grow us stronger. In 1987, there were some Soviet astronauts that were in space for 211 days. And the absence of gravity really took a toll on their muscles. And so when they came back to Earth, they were unable to walk for many days, for months, actually. Their muscles went into shock because there was no longer any pressure or tension. And so what the Soviets did is they decided, you know what, we're going to make a suit, and we're going to call it the penguin suit. I have no idea why they called it the penguin suit other than the fact that it was black on the sides and white in the middle. But this suit was super important. This suit allowed for the astronauts to have tension on their muscles while there was an absence of gravity. When they were in space, now when they came back, they experienced their muscles being able to work because there was that tension. You see, pressure produces diamonds. And when we don't have that tension in our life, when we don't have these troubles in our life, not only do we grow weak, but we grow useless. And God doesn't want his children to be useless. He wants you to be strong. Then we see not only does trials produce endurance, but trials produce maturity. The word perfect, because as you read this, testing of your faith produces steadfastness that you may be perfect and complete. I, thought, I didn't think we were perfect. And the way that that word can be better translated is mature. That's how the word is translated. And then the word complete is best translated to fully developed. Therefore, here's what we see. The end result of trials is fully developed spiritually mature. We have full maturity. It's the mom who's excited about her pregnancy, and then she loses her child. 
And instead of being mad at God, instead of being mad at her circumstances, she goes to the Lord and she says, God, you give and you take away. I trust in your promises. I know that this is not good. I know that this is not helpful for me. I know, and this makes me so sad, but I'm gonna trust in you regardless of the circumstances. You know what's best. You have a better plan for that child. It's the man who's been working at the firm for 20 years, and because of the economy, there's layoffs, and he gets laid off that day, and instead of being mad at his boss, instead of getting upset and just going into a spiral of depression, he sits down at dinner with his family, and he teaches his kids an amazing lesson. He leads his wife well, and as they sit down to eat, he prays, and he lets them know, I lost my job today, but God is still good. God is actually our provider. It's not my job and my wealth that, that we stand on, it's God. And so it doesn't matter if I don't have a job because I know my God will provide. If I glorify him and I do what's best and I follow his will, he will provide for us. He teaches his children and his wife a valuable lesson that day that we don't rely on our own strength, we rely on God. It's the teenager who doesn't conform to the world when the whole world is doing one thing and all the teenagers are doing one thing, they say, no, I will not conform to that. I will not drop my morals, but instead I'll be transformed by the renewing of my mind by God so that in testing, I will know his good and perfect pleasing will for my life. It's the teenager that says, I'm not gonna do that thing that every other teenager in the world seems to be doing. Instead, I'm gonna glorify God and I'm gonna stand on his word and his morals for my life. I'm gonna believe that his plans are best for mine. I don't have to do what those other teenagers are doing. See, the quality of maturity is that we can wait patiently in the storm because we know our God has a bigger plan. The fourth thing that we need to know is that trials are to be embraced. Trials are to be embraced. How do we go through the trial? Well, there's three secrets that I have for you, and it's not a secret because we just read it, but I wanna spell it out for you. The first way that we embrace a, child, a trial well is a joyful attitude. Having a joyful attitude, notice it says, count it all joy when you face many trials. How do we do that? Well, that's a muscle that we must grow. That's something that we must work out. How do we do that? We fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith, knowing that he also endured the cross and he knows what you were going through. Stop thinking of the current circumstances and start thinking of what's to come. And Jesus does that so well. In Hebrews 12, too, we see this. For the joy that set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. The night before the cross, Jesus was sweating blood. And he prayed this prayer that I believe we should all learn. He said, can you take this from me? Is there another way? Take this cup from me. But then he says something very important. It's not my will, but yours be done. Is that our prayer in the storm? God, take this from me, but if you don't, it's your will, not mine. I may have my wants and desires and dreams and aspirations, but I trust that you have a better plan for me, so I'm gonna walk in joy. In his commentary on James, Warren Wearsby writes this. He says, our values determine our evaluations. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us if we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and forget the future, trials will make us bitter, not better. I think oftentimes I've gone through trial and I've been bitter. Maybe some of you have felt the same way. You're upset with God. So how can we be joyful? Well, we work at it and we know that we're not alone. We know that we have God and we have this body here. We have each other. Another way that we can get through the trial is an understanding mind. Having an understanding mind helps us understand this is not it. There's a better future for me. I think trials draw us closer to God. They give us a greater devotion to him. But do you know that he is good? 
Do you know that he is doing these things for your good and his glory? Do you trust that he never leaves or forsakes you? Do you understand these things? Do you have the wisdom to understand that I can count it all joy when I face these trials? George Whitfield said, all trials are for two purposes, that we may better be acquainted with our own wicked hearts and that we may be better acquainted with our own beloved Savior. James 1 verse 12 says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. There is a better hope and future for us. I think oftentimes believers go through the worst hell that they will ever experience here on earth. Why? Because of, in their future, they will experience the greatest heaven and that is the presence of God. I think oftentimes we do experience hell on earth, but we know as a believer, those who put their faith and trust and hope in Jesus, this is just a mist. This is just a moment. It's here today, gone tomorrow. A third way that we can embrace these trials is with a submissive will. It says, let endurance have its perfect result. Endurance have its perfect result. The only way to the end of the trial is through it. And we know that we will be strengthened because of it. I think many people go through trials longer than God intends them to because they're not submissive. Because they rather run away from the trial. They rather, rather run away to the temptations of the world. Let me get that quick fix and feel a little bit better. I'm just gonna do this. It's gonna make me feel just a little bit better instead of standing firm on the solid foundation of Christ, instead of letting God do his work and submitting to it. There's a really good article by John Piper. Right before he was going into surgery for um, prostate cancer, he wrote this article called Don't Waste Your Cancer. And I'm not gonna read it to you guys today, but I think it's super helpful. And there's 10 things that he shares with the readers on how not to waste their cancer for, for God. John Piper, Don't Waste Your Cancer. So we see that faith that works produces stability in the trial, but we also see faith that works produces stability for trust. I think trial and trust go hand in hand. We have to trust God through the trial. And as we go through the next several verses, we're gonna see how James lays out this trust. We're gonna see how James lays these things out for us. The first thing we see is I'm to trust God for wisdom. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given. I think in the moment of trial, in the moment of storm, we need to ask for that wisdom, don't we? Because we're, we have so many thoughts running through our head, so many lies from the enemy that is telling us, no, we should run away from God, we should be mad at God, but no, we pray for wisdom. And the second thing is that I'm to trust God without wavering. When you pray, you do not waver in your prayers. You have faith that his will will be done. It says this in verse six, six and eight, it says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. If you've ever been to the beach when the currents are strong and you start walking out, you feel the current trying to take you out from your feet. And sometimes it's fun as a kid, you know, you try to go against the current, but I think as adults, we go against God. And we run into the world of waves and storms and we think that that's gonna make us feel better when in all reality, it's just crashing down on us. Life becomes more difficult and we have nowhere to stand. We're just waiting in the water and the waves are crashing down on us and it's hard to even know which way is up. But you know what the Bible says to do? It says to repent. Repentance is literally turning from your ways and heading back to the solid ground, the ground of the foundation of Jesus. Why are we putting ourselves through these trials when we don't really have to? It's time to walk back to Jesus. It's time to say, God, I can't do this on my own strength. I'm tired of wavering back and forth. I'm gonna trust in you and in you alone. Thirdly, we see I'm to trust God above my wants. 
Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. This one's a hard one for me because I'm wired in a way that I've always want something better. I always want something nicer. I'm always wanting something. And so God has really pressed on my heart to trust him with what I've been given. I think so often it's easy for us to see other people's lives and to look at what they have or how they have that ability to do that. And you want that instead of trusting what God has given you the ability to do. I think I spent all of middle school and high school trying to be somebody that God had not created me to be, losing a lot of friends, losing a lot of time and opportunity. Don't lose out on the opportunity that God has gifted you with because God has given you a specific gift to serve him and to serve this church and to go out into the world and share the good news of Jesus. But if you're too busy trying to be like somebody God didn't make you, you're gonna miss out. And that's gonna cause trial in your life that God really doesn't intend for you to walk through. The other way that we're to trust is I'm to trust God instead of my wealth. I think oftentimes we lean on that wealth that we have in our 401k, but you saw in 2008 that it crashed. Those things can crash. We put so much stock into what's in our bank account that we forget that the Lord can give and take away. And so often we, we try to hold all of our money instead of give generously like God has called us to do, and we miss out on so many things. It says this, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flowers fall and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Where is your genuine faith at? Do you have faith in the money in your bank account? Do you have faith in the things that you have? Or do you have faith in Jesus that will never, never wither, that will always be? A commentator named Linsky says this. It says, faith in Christ lifts the lowly brother beyond his trials to the great height of a position in the kingdom of Christ, whereas God's child, he is rich and may rejoice and boast. Faith in Christ does an equally blessed thing for the rich brother. It fills him with the spirit of Christ, the spirit of lowliness and true Christian humility. Get this, as the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty, so the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches and the two are equals by faith in Christ. Faith levels the playing ground and we will all kneel before the throne. Every tongue will confess, no matter how wealthy you were, no matter how poor you were, we all have the same end result, and that is judgment day. And I think we have to really ask ourselves, are we building a house on sand, or are we building a house on a firm foundation? See, Matthew 7 talks about that. And a lot of times we, we take that passage and we see that as like, you know, in this world, the storm is gonna come. Are we building our life on the firm foundation? And that's definitely what the passage is saying, but it's also saying that that's about judgment day. And on judgment day, are you able to stand because you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, with everything you've got, you love him so much so that no matter what comes your way, you can stand. Not only that, but even on judgment day, you hear my good and faithful servant welcome in. And then all that relief from this trying world is just removed. And you get to be face to face with Jesus. There's three scenarios that we can find ourselves in today. The first scenario is those who are about to step into trial. Hopefully you lean on God. Hopefully you lean on his word. Hopefully you know that you can embrace these trials with joy, with understanding, with a submissive will. And there's some of you that are going out of a trial right now. The second one, those who are in the midst of trial or going out, the going out is the third one, but in the midst of trial, you're tired, you're beat up, you're worn down, don't do it alone. Believer in the room, know that you can stand on God and you have brothers and sisters in this room that wanna pray for you. I think so often the enemy wants us to be isolated in our trials. 
He wants us to get as far away from community as we possibly can. You know, when we go through that diagnosis, we decide, I'm just not gonna go to church anymore, but you're losing out on all the prayer warriors in this church. I'm just not gonna say anything. I'm just, I'm just gonna do my own thing and I'm just gonna figure this out on my own. No, God never intended you to do that. And then those of you that are exiting a trial, don't let it be wasted. You now have a powerful testimony to share with other people. People are need to be encouraged by your testimony. And it is our goal here at Scotts Hill that we hear more transformation stories We want to join God in his work of transforming lives, and we want to know your stories. We want to be able to share your testimonies here on this platform, whether by video or here in person. And so if you have a story to tell about God's goodness in your life, regardless of the trials, please let us know. Send us an email, tucker.kelly at scottshill.org. Let me know of this testimony that you have. We received one from an individual a couple of days ago. I have yet to read it but I'm excited to read it. See, testimonies are such an encouragement to us. So as we go through the trial, as we go through the storm, here's what we need to remember, these three things. The answer to going through trials is to trust in the presence, the power, and the promise of Jesus. If you're not walking in his presence today, if you've not surrendered to God, you will never experience his power or his promises, that he is a good father, that he is our refuge, that he is our strong, mighty tower. His wings cover us, that he upholds us with his strong, mighty hand. You won't recognize those things. Why? Because you're running so far away from him. You're running away from his protection. He is a father that loves you. He's a father that wants to embrace you. He is a father that cares about every single thing that you're going through. And he knows what's best for you. Stop running and it's time to submit to him. It's time to fully surrender your life to him. Romans 10, nine reminds us, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he was raised on the third day, you will be saved. What will you be saved from? Not the trials of this earth, but eternal separation from God. Sin messed everything up and separates us from a holy God. So if you are not walking in his presence today, it's time to turn, it's time to repent. Stop swimming around in the waters of the world that is crashing down and crashing over you and causing you pain. Run to Jesus, fix your eyes on Jesus. Know that his power can get you through and his promises are true. You look through the entire Bible, you see that take place. Believer today, it's time to embrace the trial. Non-believer today, those who are not surrendered to Jesus, it's time to surrender to him. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word. But God, thank you for sending Jesus to us. God, it's because of your son that we are even able. It's because of your son and your grace that's so freely given to us that we can walk in righteousness and in purity. And Father, I pray even as we go through the storm that we would recognize that you're here with us, that you love us, you care for us. God, I pray for the individual in this room that is dealing with the hardest thing they've ever had to go through. Lord, I pray that they don't do it alone. They lean on you and they look to this body for prayer. Father, would we pray with great faith Would we pray your will? Would you teach us how to do these things as you strengthen us? It's in your name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Amen.